Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on struck by hazards, barriers, and opportunities in the construction industry. I'm Scott Ernest, Associate Director for Construction at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Reducing struck by incidents in the construction industry has long been a joint priority between NIOSH, CPWR, and the NORA Construction Sector Council. So I'm happy to be here to moderate today's event. For those who may not have heard, I'm also pleased to announce that our fourth annual National Safety Stand Down to prevent struck by incidents will take place April 17th through the 21st in coordination with the National Work Zone Awareness Week. Stay tuned and subscribe to CPWR's mailing list to find out more about future struck by webinars that we'll be holding as part of that stand down event. With the support of the NORA Construction Sector Council Struck By Work Group, CPWR is currently developing a pilot planning program focused on the use of nudges to improve pre-job and pre-task planning to prevent struck by incidents. Today, you'll hear about this pilot study as well as the preliminary research that it's based on. Now I'd like to introduce Jessica Bunting, CPWR's Research to Practice Program Director, and Grace Bartlett, a research analyst on the R2P team. Jess, I'll hand it over to you so you can get us started. Thank you, Dr. Ernest, and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to briefly give some context and background on CPWR's overarching struck by project before I hand it over to Grace to dig into the findings of our recent survey. I'm actually gonna go off video just for bandwidth issues. <clears throat> First, I'd like to acknowledge everyone on the project team. So, in addition to Grace and myself, that includes Dr. Suan Sarpi and CPWR's former R2P director, Eileen Beatty. We also rely heavily on the input and feedback, to, feedback of the NORA Construction Sector Council Struck by Work Group. So, this work group is made up of researchers, government representatives, uh, trade associations, contractors, union members, insurance companies, manufacturers. Uh, other safety and health organizations all working together on the annual stand down that Scott mentioned, and also just to reduce injuries from struck by hazards in general. So you may or may not know, um, but CPWR is grant funded. And so during at the beginning of the current uh, grant funding period, when we put forward our proposal, we set out with certain goals to explore the use of behavioral economics as a means to influence decisions related to intervention implementation, specifically safety and health intervention implementation. Uh, behavioral economics is a methodology that combines insights from both economics and psychology to influence decision making behavior. It is uh, absolutely not behavior based safety, but rather a set of techniques um, that acknowledges that rational choice is sort of bounded by things like time limits, um, the information available uh, or at hand at that point in time, uh, someone's personal knowledge and computational capacity. So, because of this, we all rely on strategies. Um, or rules of thumb to assist with decision making. Um, these are things like the human tendency to prefer the status quo or to focus on the present rather than the long term, or simply um, our tendency to use only the information available at the time, which is also known as availability bias. And so the idea here is that by structuring decision information, uh, decision options, and assistance, so that we can sort of play into these rules of thumb, we can then help people make the safest decision. Uh, the term we're using to refer to these behavioral economics techniques is nudges. And so uh, we want to know, does the use of nudges increase awareness of hazards and research-based solutions? And then going a step further, uh, does their use increase acceptance and adoption of those solutions? And then we also said that as part of the project, we would generate at least one tangible out, output or resource. So um, our next step was uh, to engage part of the research team um, in doing a literature review. And in 2021, Dr. Suan Sarpi, Eileen Beatty, uh, Grace, and our research partner, Alan Eck, published a lit review on the use of behavioral economics in the construction industry. 
Um, if you're interested in learning more, that report is posted here. But some key findings on nudges are that they are simple and transparent. Um, they are cost effective. They're flexible and able to be incorporated into existing health and safety interventions. They're effective across different groups and levels, and they're empowering to the decision maker. So once we um, had learned more about nudges, we needed to decide how to best apply the use of nudges to influence safety decisions. Because struck by incidents are a leading cause of both injury and death in construction, and because they're ubiquitous across trades and job sites, we decided to focus our efforts there. We went to the Norris Struck by Work Group with our behavioral economics research and asked for feedback on how we might be able to pilot test these techniques to help prevent struck by incidents. Um, pretty quickly, the work group came up with the idea to focus on planning. Planning is critical to ensuring proper equipment is available, workers are trained and certified, traffic planning has taken place, etc. It encourages communication between everyone on the job site. Um, this uh, allows for improved hazard identification and then coming up with solutions. Um, and so, uh, you know, we were all in agreement and this is how the idea of our pilot planning program came about. Our, uh, once we had a direction for the project, our next step was to conduct a survey on, survey on struck by hazards, barriers and opportunities. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Grace to tell us more about the findings from that survey. Thanks, Jess, um, and hi, everyone. So as Jess just mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about key findings from a survey that we conducted earlier this year on um, struck by incidents. Uh, since the findings are being used to inform the content and strategies included in the pilot project uh, that Jess mentioned, and we'll be talking more about later on in this presentation. Um, so just some background before I get into the results. Um, since 2020, CPWR has conducted two surveys on behalf of the Nora Constructor Sector Council Struck by Work Group. The first was administered in March 2020 to gain insights into the construction industry's understanding of struck by hazards and to inform the approach used and materials developed um, for the first stand down to prevent struck by incidents, which was held in April of 2020. The findings from the 2020 survey and also subsequent work group discussions uh, led CPWR to explore the use of behavioral economics concepts such as nudges to influence decisions that could prevent struck by incidents um, and also begin work on the pilot project to test these techniques um, and develop and implement a related struck by prevention planning program. So to inform these efforts, CPWR conducted a second survey in the beginning of this year. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the findings from this survey today and then comparing select results to the 2020 survey. So the survey provides insights into the causes of struck by incidents, barriers to prevention, and ways to raise awareness and ensure use of safe practices, uh, the measures being taken to protect workers, and the barriers to implementing controls for common struck by hazards. Um, and also knowledge of struck by hazards, the role of planning and prevention, and the motivators, resources, and support needed to prevent incidents. So the survey questions were developed and tested by CPWR staff and members of the Nora Constructor Sector Council Struck by Work Group. It consisted of 43 multiple choice questions, including select questions from the 2020 survey. Uh, it was administered online using Qualtrics, and a link to the survey was distributed by email to a convenient sample of industry stakeholders in CPWRs and the work groups network. So, uh, contractors, workers, trainers, um, safety and health professionals, etc. And participants were given four weeks to complete the survey. And in addition, participant uh, participation was completely voluntary, and all responses were anonymous. So we received 208 responses. Uh, the majority of participants said they work for a contractor and most frequently work in the commercial segment of the industry. And in addition, participants mostly identified as safety and health professionals and had more than 10 years of experience in the construction industry. 
so respondents were asked what they believed was the primary cause of struck by incidents. So they identified working around heavy equipment or vehicles and falling and flying objects from work being performed at heights or on the same level as the top causes. Um, and although the survey included more detailed response options than the 2020 survey, um, the primary causes selected in the 2020 survey were also working around heavy construction equipment and falling tools or objects. So to gain insights into the steps currently being taken to protect, to protect workers from struck by hazards, um, participants were asked if their work involved um, a specific hazard, and if it did, they were asked what their company currently does to protect workers. So as shown in this table, uh, regardless of the struck by hazard, the measures taken most often by companies to protect workers um, or to train the workers on the hazard, restrict access to the work area and using personal protective equipment. So participants were asked, um, they also responded to questions uh, concerning how steps taken to prevent struck by hazards are enforced uh, and what motivates or would motivate their company to take steps to protect workers. So in terms of enforcement, uh, three out of four participants said a four person or a site supervisor or manager is responsible for enforcement. Um, and then this was closely followed by uh, an employee who has stop work authority, a safety officer or health and safety committee member and a competent person. In terms of the top motivators to protect workers from struck by hazards, um, participants said their company is currently or would be motivated by a recognition that it's a serious hazard, an owner general contractor requirement, um, a workers' compensation insurance premium modification, or a regulatory requirement. So to understand the barriers to preventing struck by injuries, uh, protecting workers, participants were asked to select the biggest barriers for employers and for workers, and the biggest barriers for specific struck by hazards. So for employers, um, the top three barriers to engaging in practices that would prevent struck by incidents were uh, a lack of understanding or information to address hazards, scheduling pressure, um, and a lack of training. And these results were consistent with the 2020 survey findings. For workers, um, the top three barriers were lack of pretest planning, emphasis on production, and a lack of training. And these findings did differ slightly from those in 2020 because in the 2020 survey, um, lack of training was selected as a top barrier, but lack of pretest planning hadn't been a response option at that time. So in addition, participants who, uh, whose work involved a struck by hazard were asked to identify the biggest barriers to implementing controls to protect workers. So this table is showing the top barriers selected for each struck by hazard. And what's noteworthy is that regardless of the struck by hazard, the barriers selected the most often um, were lack of understanding of how to adjust the hazard across different jobs and working conditions, scheduling pressure or an emphasis on production and lack of training. So the impact of time constraints on safety caused by these scheduling production pressures was also reinforced um, in a separate question that asked about the priority companies place on safety, even when work is behind schedule. So as you can see in the graph, um, only a quarter of participants said that safety is always a priority. Um, in addition to barriers, several questions explore the role of planning and addressing struck by hazards. So when asked if their company includes strategies to prevent struck by incidents when planning a project, uh, the majority of respondents said that their company does include strategies at some stage in the planning process. Um, and most said it occurs both, both before a project starts and when it's underway. Um, and only 9% said strategies to prevent struck by incidents are not incorporated into project planning. Um, and the most common reasons for this were that contractors have little control over struck by hazards uh, produced by other contractors on job sites, and there is no time to identify and prevent struck by hazards um, because of production and scheduling pressures. 
So of the respondents who said their company does plan to prevent struck by incidents, um, 147 responded to a follow-up question asking about the planning activities they used. So the planning activities selected the most often were conducting um, job hazard analyses before work begins and conducting job hazard analyses periodically before a new task or a type of work begins. In a follow-up question, Participants were asked what motivates or would motivate their company to plan ahead to prevent struck by incidents. Uh, responses selected most often were to protect workers, a worker's compensation premium modification, a regulatory requirement, and an owner general contractor requirement. So in terms of participants' knowledge of struck by hazards, and ways to prevent incidents, um, the majority said that they were very or extremely knowledgeable about both struck by hazards and ways to prevent them. Um, however, although um, most participants indicated that they were very extremely knowledgeable um, about these struck by hazards and ways to prevent them, um, they identified several areas where additional help is needed uh, to prevent struck by incidents, including training on how to identify and prevent struck by hazards, and training on how to conduct a job hazard analysis um, for struck by hazards. And these results are important because, as mentioned earlier, um, the planning activities that were used the most often, which was job hazard analyses, were also the ones that participants said they needed help uh, to carry out. So, finally, respondents were asked to identify the best ways to raise awareness of struck by hazards and ensure safe practices are used on job sites. And the approaches selected most often were toolbox talks, training program, programs, and posters and signs. Um, and while training was identified as one of the most common measures companies take to protect workers and one of the best ways to raise awareness and ensure use of safe practices, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lack of training and a lack of information were identified as two of the biggest barriers to engaging in prevention practices. Uh, so these findings indicate that training and information gaps uh, may be limiting the effectiveness of planning and other prevention activities. And it's something that we're taking into consideration with our pilot project to address barriers and support more effective planning and decision making. And I also just want to point out that these results are uh, were consistent with the 2020 survey findings, um, which also identified toolbox talks and posters on job sites among the best ways to raise, uh, raise awareness um, and the most notable differences between this survey and, and the 2020 survey were that a higher percentage of participants selected training programs um, in this current survey than in 2020. Um, and there was also an expanded list of response options in the 2022 survey, uh, which, which were included to help um, inform our selection of nudges for the pilot study. Um, so, if you're interested in learning more about the survey and the findings, I'd encourage you to check out the full report um, and there's a link on the slide. And now I'm going to turn things back over to Jess to talk about the Struck by Prevention Planning Program. Excuse me. I'm recovering from a cold. <laughs> Uh, before I get into the program, I'd like to emphasize that it is still very much being developed. Um, so while we have the basic idea and content drafted, we aren't sure what the final format of the resource will be and how everything will link together. Um, so our next step is to get feedback from a voluntary subcommittee of subject matter experts um, that are part of the Struck by Work Group. And then after that, we'll uh, finalize the first iteration with the expectation that it may also be updated further um, early on in the study, just as we get some initial feedback from our participants. <clears throat> to give you a big picture overview of the program, um, it will consist of some background information on why you should have a plan, followed by three main sections. The first section walks users through identifying the risks, breaking it down by type of hazard, looking at falling, flying, swinging, or rolling objects. Um, and then based on the user's responses to each question in section one, they will have the option to click on a link for more resources to help generate a plan to address each hazard faced. Section two um, will be where uh, users can keep track of the plan solutions or create uh, the actual plan. 
um, for each hazard. And then section three uh, focuses on the use of nudges to support ongoing planning and will include ready to use nudges um, that reinforce the plans made in section two. <clears throat> For those unsure about their readiness to use uh, the planning program, we've just provided some background information um, with some statistics on struck by incidents um, and how they impact the construction industry. Um, and then uh, some reasons on why you really um, should plan ahead to prevent them. And so um, by planning ahead of the project, I'll just say that uh, starting at the, the bidding stage, you can eliminate struck by hazards at the source. Um, so thinking about the hierarchy of controls, um, where we want to start with engineering controls, elimination, um, getting rid of hazards before uh, workers are even doing the work. Um, that in order to do that, you have to plan ahead, right? Um, so at this stage, uh, you may need to involve uh, the estimator, the project manager, the safety director, a competent person or competent people, um, if needed, manufacturers and suppliers, owners or general contractors. Um, you need to make sure that you communicate with all uh, parties that are going to be involved. I, I know that can be difficult and it may take some extra time, but doing it upfront is really critical. And then Pre-job planning before a project starts may also involve the project superintendent, manager, uh, again, competent persons, uh, poor person, uh, manufacturers, general contractor, if you're not the general contractor, subcontractors, if you are. Um, once uh, daily planning begins, um, this is, you know, the planning that's happening pre-shift and pre-task. Um, it needs to happen on an ongoing basis in order to keep employees engaged to get them aware of the hazards, aware of solutions, and aware of the policy um, of how to address um, those hazards. Um, when considering who should be involved at, in the daily planning stage, the short answer really is everyone. Um, those making major decisions, like the foreperson and those carrying out the work, or others working nearby should all be included in pre-task planning. Um, the planning meeting is a critical time for those working together and others working nearby to communicate, get on the same page about potential hazards and to figure out how to protect themselves and one another. Um, so moving into section one, we're gonna take a look at identifying the risks. And the goal here is not only to prompt individuals to think through each aspect of the job that could present um, struck by hazards, which is influenced by our research on nudges, um, but not only to provide those prompts, but also to provide supplemental information. Um, again, increasing the amount of information that people have easily accessible and available to them at the time to help them make safer decisions. Uh, because struck by is such a broad category of hazards. We've not only divided this section into the four different types of struck by hazards that I already touched on, um, but within each subsection, we've added a series of questions to further break down potential risks of each specific um, job site. And so within falling objects, we've asked, will there be work at heights? Will materials be transported by truck, crane, or other moving equipment? Um, and are there materials or tools heavy enough to injure someone when dropped on the same level? These may not be the final questions that we end up going with, um, but you can see that uh, where our line of thought is going. Um, and each one is accompanied by a little bit of detail on why saying yes would indicate the presence of struck by hazards. Um, and each one also has, again, a link to more information on planning and solutions to help those uh, completing the plan make the best decisions to keep themselves and others safe on the job site. So using the first question as an example, if I were to click on the link for more information on planning and solutions for work at heights, I would get something like this, which includes tips to protect workers, followed by supplemental links to planning resources, training resources, relevant standards, and our recommended nudges to improve and reinforce planning. Again, this is just a draft, um, but you can see that we're going to basically try to pull together all the resources that we have. And then we're also going to be looking at what supplemental uh, resources we need to add 
um, to better support the planning program overall as part of this study. So just moving on um, to, to quickly go through um, an outline of the other sections. Um, under flying objects, we ask about whether workers will use pneumatic or power actuated tools like nail guns, um, or if there will be unsecured materials that could cause collision inju injuries. Um, under rolling objects, this is a, a big category um, and includes the questions, will there be heavy equipment or work vehicles in use? Will there be delivery trucks coming onto the job site? Will employees be driving and or parking personal vehicles on or near the site? Um, <clears throat> will there be road or other work that exposes workers to non-construction motor vehicles? And then finally, um, swinging objects asks whether cranes will be used and who will be in the vicinity. Then moving on to section two, this is essentially just a worksheet to keep track of the overall plan to address each type of struck by hazard. If you already have software or a planning document that you use, you could just input the relevant information there instead of using this section. Um, but it will be a takeaway piece that can then be incorporated into other planning processes and used to inform everything um, from fitting processes to job site practices. Using the supplemental resources in section one, as well as the nudges in section three, users should write down what needs to be done at each phase of the job. So I've pulled out just the questions related to falling objects to show you what this section might look like. Here you can see if I had said yes to work at heights, I would use this space to jot out the equipment needed, plans for scheduling and placing work, um, worker training, et cetera. I would then continue down the list addressing the hazards that I said yes to in section one. And then finally, section three will have all of the recommended nudges that we've put together in one place. Um, again, we're just referring to these as nudges in the, in the pilot program. Um, as I said in the, the beginning, um, you know, behavioral economics is not behavioral based safety. It's not performance based safety. Uh, we don't want to conflate the two and there's some obvious confusion there um, that could happen. And so rather than referring to the behavioral economics techniques, um, we're referring to the also, uh, you know, accepted uh, term nudges. Um, so, as you saw earlier in the supplemental resources slide, we're also planning on highlighting these nudges um, that are relevant to each sub hazard um, on those resource sheets, but we wanted to ha also have them gathered together with some context um, all in one place. And so examples of nudges we plan to include are training and reinforcement activities, um, reminders like text messages or stickers and ideas to incentivize employee involvement. Um, again, it should be just you know, reiterated and, and understood that we're not um, trying to shift the responsibility here to the employee. Um, planning, again, um, is the behavior that we're targeting and it should involve everyone on the job site. Um, we are just trying to support that planning uh, by providing um, not only as much information as is needed, but also appropriate reminders and um, nudges to just keep people on track. Um, so, we would love it if some of you online today end up participating in this pilot study, um, but we will also make the pilot program available online to anyone interested in using it once we feel that we have an iteration um, that is ready to share. Um, so who should participate? Uh, contractors of any size can participate. Um, in fact, we are very interested in working with some small employers. Um, because the program is customizable in that not every section is applicable on every job, um, we do not expect study participants to be testing out every planning section or every nudge that's included. Um, we will connect with you through an initial planning meeting to talk through a research plan that works for not only your project, um, but uh, your work schedule, uh, your job site, um, and makes sense for us to be able to gather our research over, um, you know, a, a large period of time. Um, we anticipate having additional meetings over roughly a six to 12 month period. Um, so there will be some flexibility. Um, and depending on your location, we would be interested on coming to in coming on site as well. Um, 
We do plan to do baseline and follow up surveys to help determine the effectiveness of uh, the planning program and the included nudges. Um, so you would have to be willing to participate in those surveys. Um, we're also interested in hearing from workers at that, those times. Um, so if you are interested, please contact Grace um, and we'll set up an initial Zoom call with you. Um, before I wrap up, I did want to take this opportunity to follow up on Scott's earlier announcement of the fourth annual national stand down to prevent struck by incidents. Um, CPWR manages the main page for the stand down, which can be accessed at the link on your screen. Um, and I believe Miles also put that in the chat as well. Um, you can find not only previously recorded stand down events there, um, but also training materials, research, um, a, a ton of infographics and toolbox talks. A lot of the supplemental resources that are going to be going into the planning program um, already exist and are on this page. Um, I also uh, wanted to point out that we have a preventing head injuries web page that includes resources from both CPWR and other organizations um, like NIOSH and OSHA. Uh, head protection is obviously a key way to protect against dropped objects. Um, and there's a lot going on in the inter industry over the last few years with tr the transition from the traditional hard hat to the helmet style hard hats. Um, so we have a short head protection awareness program video on the page. We'd love your feedback on that. Um, if you have a chance to use it, there's a, a really uh, short five minute survey um, on that uh, web page um, that you can take after you do the 15 minute video. Let us know how it is. Um, and then I also just wanted to highlight, um, this is also on that web page, but uh, NIOSH recently put out a science blog post on construction helmets and work related traumatic brain injury. Um, so there's a lot of good research and information in that article um, and I would encourage you to check it out, um, especially if you are currently debating whether or not to make the switch for your company. With that, um, I'd like to say thank you all for listening um, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Ernest, to see what kind of questions we have. I think we actually are gonna have more time for questions uh, than I expected. Sure, thank you, Janessa, thank, thank you, Grace. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, start with some of the questions we received through the registration, but if, uh, if folks that are online have other questions, uh, feel free to enter those into the chat and we'll, we'll kind of jump back and forth, but let's, uh, Let's start with the first question for Jess. And, and that question is, construction sites are dynamic. What methods are being used to understand and prevent the risk of equipment and pedestrian uh, collisions and other sorts of interactions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and when I saw that, um, I wanted to answer it because I wanted to talk uh, just briefly about one good uh, technological solution that allows users to virtually map a job site um, and keep up with it through different phases of the project, um, track identifying and tracking hazards through the life cycle, and that's building information modeling or BIM. Um, and CPWR has some information on BIM in our solutions database, um, which we will drop a link. Oh, Miles just put a link to that in the, the chat just now. Um, so I'd encourage you to go check that out. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Jess. Next question will be for Grace. Um, will there be a supplemental survey to better understand the perspectives of the workers? Uh, based on the data you presented, it was only about one, one less than 2% of the respondents were workers. Yeah, so uh, we don't have another survey like this one planned. However, um, the pilot project uh, should give us more insight on the workers' perspective. Um, and as just mentioned, um, in her presentation, we plan to do um, a baseline and follow-up surveys for both contractors and workers um, as part of that study. Okay, thank you, Grace. Uh, I have a question for Jess. Um, how would you help an old school supervisor or manager understand the importance of safety training? Uh, great question. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that changing the culture in the construction industry is a long term effort and it can feel like an uphill battle at times. Um, but I think that there are a couple of things that can help maybe our more traditional industry members 
um, rethink things a little bit. Um, one of those is the use of testimonials, um, have, having people who have been injured, people who know folks who have um, passed, um, having them share their stories. Um, if you're able to, you're doing videos. Also, I'm going to ask Miles to drop a link to the in, um, NIOSH Vitality Assessment and Control Evaluation or FACE program um, in the chat. Uh, if you are not familiar, um, the NIOSH uh, FACE program publishes detailed reports on fatality investigations that you can review with trainees uh, to emphasize the importance of uh, training on a specific topic like struck by. So you can go to this website and then um, they have it divided by the NIOSH FACE reports and state FACE reports. Um, you can open up and then search by industry, um, cause of fatality, uh, I think geographic location and other uh, criteria. They have some really uh, good and impactful reports there. Um, another suggestion would be uh, just to find ways to cultivate intergenerational relationships among the crew. Um, this conversation has actually come up with a few different industry panels that I've been on um, around mental health and, and changing the conversation around that, getting people to open up. I think the same thing applies to just safety culture in general, but um, having, doing team building, um, providing lunch, having contests, hosting holiday parties, um, whatever makes sense for your people um, so that they can get to know and respect one another, um, respect different points of views. Um, I think this can lead to people um, changing their minds about a variety of things. Um, and then I uh, definitely um, want to mention and ask Miles to share a link um, to CPWR's Foundations for Safety Leadership course. Um, if you're not familiar with this module, I cannot recommend it enough for supervisory workers. Um, it teaches students about the cost of ineffective and the benefits of effective safety leadership. Um, and most importantly, it teaches students about five critical leadership skills that they can use on the job site to more effectively communicate and work with the crew members. Um, and, and it shows how leading so, how doing so leads to a stronger safety climate and a, a better workplace. Um, can we get in the chat? Okay, thanks, Jess. Um, we did get a question in the chat. Um, Basically, it's just it's from Sarah, and she's just asking, um, does your organization do any safety training or on-site demos in the state of Florida? Sorry, what was it to any on-site? She's asking about training. I mean, I know you, you do a lot of on you know online training that people can access from really anywhere in, in the U.S. But um, they were asking, is there anything that's being done in the state of Florida? Yeah. Um, so. We, uh, our R2P department creates training, um, but we don't uh, deliver training. We have a separate training program at CPWR that does training, uh, but it is specifically for uh, North America's building trades unions. And so there is a variety of different ways that you would access that either through your union or directly through CPWR. And I am happy to connect you to our training um, department because they do do some customized um, training and um, work with folks in the uh, building trees. Um, so you can shoot me an email and I'm happy to connect you with the, the right people to talk about that further. You know, the other thing I would add to that that uh, question is, um, and I don't, know, I don't know how closely you all have looked at the CPWR website, but the webinars like we've done today, they're all being uh, recorded and documented on their website. So there's a tremendous amount of information on all sorts of different construction safety and health issues that are available on the CPWR website. And much of that could be used for training. I mean, it's really, really good information. The, the, the slides are available. Just um, really a, a wonderful resource that I think everybody could benefit from. Uh, let's go back to a question we received uh, earlier for the registration. This one's for Grace. What is the most common struck by hazard in the construction industry? Yeah, so this sort of depends on whether it's a non-fatal versus a fatal injury. But um, transportation incidents, like if you're uh, if you get struck by a vehicle, um, account for the highest number of struck by fatalities. Um, yeah, from 
2011 to 2020, um, 2,600 construction workers were killed um, and 35,000 were injured due to transportation incidents. Um, and collectively, they account for about half of fatal struck by injuries and 20% of non fatal struck by injuries um, in construction. Um, and so the CBWR's data center has actually put out several um, relevant reports on struck by incidents and transportation injuries in construction. Um, so I encourage you to check those out. Um, and we're going to put a link to the reports page in the chat. Um, and the data center also has a series of interactive data dashboards, um, including one on focus four that includes struck by incidents um, and one on fatal and not fatal injuries um, and also on transportation injuries. So I'd encourage you to check those out as well. Great, thanks Grace. Um, this question is for Jess. What uh, personal protective equipment is most useful in preventing struck by injuries? Well, um, I did touch on this a little bit in my presentation, but first I'd like to emphasize again that PPE should never be the first or only solution. Uh, it comes last in the hierarchy of controls, and so it's, it's very important to um, implement elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and other work practices to avoid incidents altogether. Um, but that said, um, I would just go back to head protection um, Again, to reiterate that hard hats are so important and that there are real benefits to the helmet style ones with the chin straps. Um, we do know that there are still some, some, I guess, maybe kinks to be worked out when it comes to things like accessories and fit, um, particularly when it comes to the use of welding hoods. Um, and I've heard for, for folks with really long or thick hair. Um, but that said, the effectiveness of the helmet when something is dropped from above and the fact that the chin strap prevents it from slipping or falling off are, are really important factors to consider. So, um, again, I would uh, encourage um, folks to check out the new NIOSH science blog on that. Um, and then I would just also add that, um, of course, when it comes to uh, a PPE for uh, working around vehicles, roadways, um, we definitely want high visibility vests and um, other gear um, in addition to, um, again, other controls like lights and things like that. Um, I do think that the high vis gear is, is very important when it comes to PPE. Okay, thanks, Jess. Appreciate that uh, response. Uh, the next question is for Grace and it has to do with uh, workplace violence, which is obviously a, a big issue now, unfortunately. That if someone is involved in a fight or is actually shot at work, how is that type of an incident classified? Um, so, no, it's not. Um, so, violent incidents, including shootings or um, injuries to somebody caused by another person, are actually classified separately um, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and are not considered struck by incidents. Okay. Thank you, Grace. And then um, we have a question about um, this one is for Jess. Again, this came in early, but uh, how can we incorporate um, other trades on site into our pre job conversations? You know, we know the struck by hazards for our own trade, but what about the struck by hazards for other trades? Yeah, um, and I, I think I sort of touched on this a little bit um, when talking about the planning program and the need to not operate in a silo when you're thinking about the pre-bid or the pre-job planning, but I, the same thing applies when you're on the job. And I, I know it can certainly be challenging, um, but if you're a general contractor or in a project management position, um, the expectation of communication and coordination can be set up front and as a condition of work, um, put it in writing, you may already have a pre-qualification process, but even if you don't and you don't have to do this, you can still um, use the opportunity of selecting and initially engaging with subcontractors um, to discuss um, so safety and also general communication, establishing methods for ongoing communication as the job progresses um, between crews and, you know, include in a written agreement um, language about how you will work together. Um, you can require regular uh, 
process reporting and work status updates that can help uh, keep everyone on the same page. Maybe a project management software is a good fit. Um, but we're also hoping that just using this new pilot planning program that we're putting together will act as a tool to sort of facilitate um, this type of communication and joint planning as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, I know that it's less in control in your control if you're not um, the GC, but um, the same thing goes as far as having upfront conversations, bring up safety the same way you would discuss the schedule, uh, the workflow, supplies, site access, uh, those types of things. And again, consider putting it in writing. Um, you know, I'm also going to bring up team building here because I think the same way that it can help safety and communication. Um, to engage in team building activities within your own crew. Um, I think it can help when you get to know other contractors and other crews on site, um, especially if it's a long project or if depending on um, your geographic area, if maybe you're likely to work with them again on a frequent basis, um, and then I, I think um, you know you can end up uh, having really good communication and really good safety records um, by establishing that relationship. Okay, very good. Thank you, Jess. Um, that was all the questions we've gotten in advance. I'm just trying to see if there's anything um, uh, on the, in the chat that we haven't uh, addressed yet. Here's here's one that just just came in from uh, Javier Reyes. Um, so this is for really either either one. Um, how does suicide prevention awareness, how is that being delivered on, on the construction site? Um, yeah, I, 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 this is not particularly relevant to today's conversation, but I'm thank you for bringing it up. Um, I think that it's always a good time to talk about suicide prevention in construction uh, for those who don't know where we're seeing um, in particular male construction workers uh, die from suicide at five times the rate that they're dying um, from work related incidents. Um, and we actually just recently did um, both a webinar and a podcast um, on, on this topic that had a lot of great resources in it. Um, and I will uh, pull that up. Um, you already have our webinars page. There's a whole section there um, on uh, mental health um, that I would encourage you as uh, webinars on suicide, workplace stress, um, and opioid uh, use and prevention. Um, and then I just dropped the podcast link in the chat um, that I would encourage you to check the most recent podcast on suicide prevention in the construction industry, which was also translated into Spanish. Um, and then the uh, Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention is a really good place to start, CISP. They um, offer uh, free training um, through Living Works um, that is sort of an introductory training that's really good um, uh, for some basic skills about suicide prevention. That one is free, but Living Works also offers like a full, uh, I think, eight hour training, mental health first aid training, um, you can find providers in your community is, is another good one um, to get some folks trained up. And, it, you know, it's not specific to construction, but it's full of, of skills that can be, um, you know, applied in conversations with, with anyone, um, you know, in, in any industry. And um, I would just say, um, just in general, don't shy away from the conversation if you can help it. Um, don't be afraid to ask someone if they are struggling or if they need help or or straight out ask, um, you know, are you thinking of killing yourself? Research shows that that is not going to put the idea in someone's head. Um, you know, that, that is absolutely not going to be the reason that they consider or, um, you know, go through with it. Um, so, you know, you have every reason to just reach out and ask, even if they don't take you up in your on your offer to talk at that time, they may reach back out later. Um, obviously, I'm uh, passionate about this subject and I would be happy to, to talk about it more if anyone um, wants to follow up. Um, and then yeah, this is, not, I, thanks, thanks, Jess. I mean, this is a huge issue for our industry. Um, I would also point out, in addition to what Jess said, that um, CPWR 
I hosted a workshop this this summer. It was in August in Washington. Uh, it was two days. It was focused on not only suicides but also, also opioids in the construction industry. And uh, as a uh, follow up to that workshop, there have been uh, four different work groups that have been established that are actively working on various aspects of of issues related to both suicides in the construction industry, as well as um, as well as opioids and uh, substance use disorder. Looks like there's another question that came in. Uh, this is from Tina Chen. She says, um, I, I had one question. Did the research team observe any differences on struck by prevention, practice, and planning when comparing commercial and heavy civil sectors, since these two sectors had the highest percentage of surveys? Um, we didn't. Um, that's something we could look into. Um, not sure what the response rate um, would depend on the response route, but um, something we can look into. Okay, thanks, Grace. And I think uh, I think that's going to wrap things up. And unless there's any other questions, um, no. Yeah, I, I did see one. Uh, one came in um, from Ron Sokol to me privately that just asked um, if the follow up, uh, if the pilot program will have GCs. Uh, specialty contractors, uh, structural steel, HVAC, bricklayers, et cetera. Um, and I just would like to answer that we really hope that it will have a uh, wide variety of different types of contractors in it. We, um, again, would encourage you to get in touch with us by emailing Grace if you're interested in participating, um, because uh, like I, I said earlier, you know, uh, struck by incidents are, are uh, so ubiquitous, but also so varied, and so we'd, we'd really like to get uh, input from as many different types and, and sizes of contractors as we can. Thank you. Okay, and then let's see here. One other one. What is CPWR's thoughts on the use of chains for recovery of vehicles? I... I'm unable to answer that question. Um, I'm not familiar with the use of chains versus uh, ropes. Um, that's, uh, outside of mine and, and Grace's expertise, um, those are the types of questions we go to the struck by work group for. So uh, again, uh, feel free to email me and I'm happy to um, reach out to a few of those subject matter experts um, offline. Okay, great. Thanks, Jess. Uh, thanks, Grace, and thanks, Miles. I uh, want to just uh, thank CPWR for uh, hosting the webinar. I want to thank everybody who uh, connected in and participated, and I hope everybody has a great uh, rest of your week. So thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone.